Hey, it's the Nerdy Sports Fan. Now, the NFL schedule just got released, and we're going to get into that in the coming days. I'm actually going to be breaking down a schedule video for every individual team within the next week or so. So keep tuned for that. But now I actually want to talk about what remains of free agency. So not everybody goes day one. Not everybody goes before the draft. A lot of these guys, and it happens every single year, real contributors last till after the draft and really into training camp and preseason. A lot of it's by choice. A lot of it's veterans wanting to see how things shake out in the draft and want to make sure they're actually going to be able to start. Um, want to hook on with a team that they think is capable of winning the Super Bowl almost exclusively. Uh, those sorts of things. Uh, a lot of it's not by choice. The Cam Newton example right now. I'm sure he would love to be signed by a team. But he wants to start. His track record is relatively deserving of that, but teams are terrified of whether or not he's going to actually be recovered from injury because, man, that was a bit of a train wreck the past couple of seasons watching him try to fight through these injuries. So, yeah, I mean, people want to get their hands on him, and they can't. Nobody can. So coronavirus has really screwed up a lot of this for some of these players. So, I wanted to talk about it because when I was reviewing the available free agents, and anybody can do this, you, you can go to what um, many people believed were the top 100 available free agents and just sift through the guys who have all signed. Uh, there are almost a full defense worth of players that would have produced far better than the Bengals defense did last year. I understand that's a low bar. I get it. But if you can put together a full NFL defense with veteran players that are still available on the market right now, that says to me there's something odd going on. Now, a lot of these guys have some, you know, relatively unique circumstances. So I just want to hit a couple of notes on these folks. Uh, obviously, the Cam Newton thing has been beaten to death by the media. Um, a lot of people think there's no reason he shouldn't be on a team and starting. And then most of the rest of the people just point and say, hey, you know, shoulder. Nobody knows. He was a train wreck. It's okay. Um, and he'll probably hook on with a team sometime during free agency, but I don't want to dwell on that, really. Um, Jadavian Clowney is a very interesting thing to me. Um, still extremely productive when healthy, but really has been fighting injuries very, very similar to Cam. So he probably felt his market was stronger than it actually was. Uh, there's reports of things kind of turning south in Seattle, which... I don't understand why they would. It's probably a behind closed doors kinds of thing, but really, I think it's more financial and obvious. I just feel that Genevieve Clowney felt his market was far stronger than it actually was. He probably thought he was worth the kind of money that, you know, Frank Clark got. And um, it didn't work for him in Houston. Sure as shit wasn't going to work for him in Seattle, the team that got rid of Frank Clark for wanting that kind of money. So nobody else wants to give it to him either. You know, older pass rushers lose a step. And he's an extremely effective defender at penetrating into the backfield, stopping the run. But he doesn't get to the quarterback as quick as he used to. And he's always had, you know, some sort of injury issue. So, yeah, it, it makes sense that he's available. Um, if and only if he really is asking for top pass rusher money, because he, he simply is not worth that anymore. I would view him in the second, if not third tier of pass rushers. So him hooking on with any team anytime soon, probably not likely. I like him going to a team like the Cardinals, personally. 
Um, him hooking in with a rotation, including Chandler Jones, another aging pass rusher. Uh, I just think that team has the right dynamic on their defensive front for him to fit in, really seriously contribute, and not necessarily just get bombarded with 75 80% of the snaps every game. So it, it ends his already diminishing career that much sooner. So I hope Jadavion Clowney finds you know, the middle ground in contract negotiations soon enough so he can still remain in the league and relevant. Um, Everson Griffin is another edge rusher. It's just he's getting older. And he had a resurgent year last year. Like He kind of tailed off and then came right back up last year. So I was not expecting Griffin to still be available. Plenty of defensive linemen have been signed in, in this offseason. There's a focus more on pressure up the middle of the field, though. So I think that's actually hurting both of these guys a bit. Uh, edge rush doesn't seem to be as big of a need as pressure up the middle. Defensive tackles that can rush the passer as well as stop the run. So I feel like we're entering an era where defensive tackles are getting smaller, yes, but defensive ends are getting larger. Um, A.J. Epinesa, who the Bills just recently drafted, probably should be the mold. You know, uh, Derek Brown um, is another guy that you could talk about. He, he plays defensive tackle, yes, but he also plays defensive end. Marlon Davidson, a lot of these guys getting drafted, they just move all the way up and down the line. So the size of these edge rushers just being speedy, small guys might be a thing of the past because of the amount of pressure you need up the middle, which of course pushes a lot of the run-stuffing responsibility off onto the ends. It's intriguing to think about. But Everson Griffin is a talent that really has a place in this league. Um, word on the street is that he's talking to the Vikings about a return. It's an odd situation with him, though, because he actually voided the last year of his contract thinking that he was going to have a very strong market. Didn't really work out because he should have made $10 million, And even if he returns to the Vikings, I highly doubt... His number is going to be anywhere near that. It's going to be a big piece of humble pie he's got to eat in order to come back for the purple. And, and I just, mm, man, that is tough. That is a tough thing to swallow as a man with an ego, which any of these pro athletes are, okay? They're in a situation where they have one of maybe 60 or 70 jobs possible on the planet. So obviously they got a lot of ego to him. Him taking a big pay cut, thinking that he was going to be able to give himself a raise, that's a tough pill to swallow. Anyways, moving on, uh, Logan Ryan, still available. Um, the NFL does not ever uh, say, hey, you know what we have too many of? Defensive backs. Ever. Ever. Uh, okay, they, they're... Extremely, extremely versatile, extremely useful. Um, so even depth defensive backs. Everybody needs a nickel and dime, you know, corner. Everybody needs special teams coverage that can actually get up to speed to, to stop somebody before they reach the 20. Um, so you never have enough defensive backs. It's really shocking to me that Logan Ryan is still available because he... he was a regular starter for a defense that was fantastic for the Tennessee Titans. Now, people are going towards more coverage rather than pass rush. And that concept probably doesn't necessarily work for Logan Ryan's skill set. He, he's actually a, a different kind of corner. Um, he hits hard. He tackles extremely well. He allowed receptions a little more than you like to see from a defensive back. He just didn't allow people to frickin' move after they made the reception. So he's effective against the West Coast offense. Uh, the dink and dunk kind of offenses where, hey, you know, get the ball out into the guy's hands and let him make something happen. 
Yeah. Sure. Get him in get the ball into his hands after only traveling two yards, and then he'll just get pegged to the turf right there. That's the kind of defensive back that Logan Ryan is. So he kind of is the defensive back of this generation. But people looking at raw numbers aren't necessarily going to see that. And unless you're looking at a hell of a lot of film and you scheme according to his skill set, yeah, coaches don't like doing that generally. They, it, barring a few, there are a few coaches that are absolutely fantastic at making what they do fit the skills of their players. Most coaches do the exact opposite, which is terrible. Um, trying to shoehorn people into what you want to do defensively, regardless of their skill set. So that, I think, is going to dominate this market. Uh, this market of free agency is all about perfect fit. The perfect fit for Logan Ryan might not exist at the financial tier he wants to be at. Personally, I, I think if he goes to the Buccaneers, he's an instant upgrade to what they had last year. So I'd, I'd love to see him go join Tom Brady in, you know, Patriots South there. But we'll see what happens. Um, Jason Peters, former regular all-pro left tackle, probably the best left tackle of his generation on the market. Now, he's older. He's had some more recent injury issues. I get it. But... There's just, there's easily a dozen NFL teams that wish they had better play at left tackle. I, I know that the Rams probably could have snagged him instead of Whitworth. Uh, the Broncos. I, In fact, I would love to see Jason Peters on the Broncos right now. Because... Uh, Garrett Bowles has been a train wreck for them. And maybe it's a point of pride thing for Elway because it was a first round pick, but the guy's terrible. And is plugging in a bit better offensive line play at the left tackle position would be a big upgrade for your young quarterback and that fresh, shiny, new receiving core that you just assembled. I, I, so yeah, I, I would love to see Jason Peters going to the Broncos. Um, I don't think he goes anywhere but Philly, honestly. I think he's just in regular contact with them, and they're waiting on the medical. But, um, again, Denver, I think, would be a great destination. Um, there's a number of defensive players that aren't necessarily the big names, but they're still solid. Um, Marcus Golden, defensive end, and for the Giants last year, he put up 10 sacks. And... and that's not a number to sneeze at. You've got to look at a lot of film on him, though, and try and ascertain if those sacks are coverage sacks or he wasn't necessarily doing what he was supposed to within the scheme. That's very difficult to gauge, though. You have to know what the play call was. And defensive coaches aren't necessarily going to let that cat out of the bag. So you just have to know that defensive set very, very, very well. And be able to ascertain what play he was supposed to be in based off what the other players were doing. And it can be very tedious. But you do not get 10 sacks by accident. You might get 3, 4, 10 means you're doing something right. So uh, Marcus Golden should hook on with the team and be an effective player in a defensive rotation on the front line at the very least. The very least, you know, teams like the Jets that are desperate for pass rush, snag him. All right, he won't even have to move, okay? He just has to change his color jersey. Uh, Prince of Mukamara, um, not really sure why he's been in the free agent market five times. Five times this guy has been a free agent. That doesn't happen at all. So some of these players are lucky to see free agency once in their career. Now, the bigger names, 
you know, a lot of times never see free agency. They just keep on getting locked up by the team that they, you know, got drafted by. Um, that second tier, that's still extremely, extremely good, but not necessarily the guy that you definitely want to lock onto your roster. Those are the guys that can see free agency a couple of times. Prince of Mukamara getting to free agency for now the fifth time tells me he is absolutely an effective starter. But he's absolutely not so talented and such a good locker room guy that people just want to lock him up and keep him there long term. I don't know if it's a culture fit thing or people just don't see the talent, but Amukamara would be an instant upgrade to a team like Tampa. Um, I'd like to see him in Denver. Uh, another player that I think is a great fit for that team. Um, Vic Fangio knows Prince of Mukamara, considering their time together with the Bears. And I think he's exactly what they need. Also considering Chris Harris left. So I think it's a perfect fit. It's probably just a financial thing and seeing what they were going to do in the draft. But him going to Denver makes a hell of a lot of sense to me. Um, Clayton Gethers and... Um, Tony Jefferson are safeties that lost their job to injury, essentially. Um, Gathers uh, loses out to, uh, I want to say, Kari. Um, oh, Kari Willis um, ended up being the starter there, rookie, and just never let go of the job. Uh, I think Gathers is still, he's still got plenty in the tank. So he'll be effective. Um, but a lot of these safeties as they get older, especially, uh, players that play in the box more, uh, like Eric Reed, that's available still right now. Um, they just lose something on their hitting that makes it so you have to ex be willing to accept a smaller role. You have to be willing to accept that you might be going back on special teams for a bit if you want to hook onto the roster. And a lot of these veterans don't really have that in mind and they end up holding out for better a little bit too long and by the time they hook on to the roster they're really just getting the veteran minimum and i see that in the future for a lot of these guys he gathers jefferson reed i don't see them getting anything more than the veteran minimum uh, for the rest of their careers now, anytime you lose out to a younger player you get hurt and the defensive secondary gets better you're on the outs you may still have enough left in the tank to play in the league, but not on the level you used to. So these guys, they need to be willing to take a little bit less money. Um, Damien, Damon Harrison. Um, sorry, I was about to say Damien. Um, Snacks Harrison, formerly of the Lions, really did not want to be in Detroit anymore. Um, so he kind of forced his way out. Um did not have a landing spot. He's one of the best run stuffers in the league. But that means he's got to find a defense that values that run stuffing defensive tackle. And a lot of the defenses that really value that run stuffing defensive tackle have already solidified one. So DJ Reader got snapped up by the, um, the Bengals. And Houston replaced Reader by drafting somebody um maybe the titans maybe the titans might be a good landing spot for uh harrison because you know uh casey leaving and finding a home in denver really puts a hole in their uh, defensive front um i would have said buffalo but the restructured star latulale and it's really the role that you know harrison would fill um, I would have said Baltimore, but they've done so much on that defensive front. I don't see them investing yet even more in veteran depth. Uh, if anything, they're you know just going to want to invest in young talent as drafts go on in the next few years. But all of these guys have a place in the league still. And again, you assemble your starting defense off of just... For the most part, the guys that I mentioned, 
you've got a better defense than what the Bengals fielded last year. So all of these guys are useful. They could potentially upgrade your team. Let me know what you think. Let me know what of these folks still available in free agency you'd like to see on your team. Like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. Keep it tuned here because we're breaking down the schedule and doing record predictions in the coming weeks. Thanks for watching, guys.